So jump in, feel free to ask any questions and we'll kind of go from there. So it's very interactive and I like to start with these silly little quizzes. And I'm curious how many of you know the answer to this one. I have a handout too that I can forward after the fact. But what's the emoji for Adderall? Wow. I think it's D. Okay, anyone else? Didn't know there was one. <laughs> no, right, exactly. Mm, a lot of people are guessing. Guesses? A lot of A's. A -D -A. A. So the right answer is A. It's so pill add a rail Adderall. Um, mm. This uh, C is cough syrup. D is MDMA or Molly. What do you think this one is? Mass heroin. Heroin dragon. Heroin. Yep, Michelle got it. Yep. Okay. Next one. So what are significant risk factors for non-medically used of prescription stimulants and abuse among adolescents? Parents with higher levels of education, schools located in the northeastern region of the U.S., schools in suburban areas, schools with higher proportion of white students, schools with medium levels of binge drinking, or all of the above. I'd say all, risk factors. all of the above. Right. So why is that? Typically, when we look at uh, abuse of prescription stimulants, right, so the medical and non-medical use, which, which most of you are aware of, it's a matter of access. It is much easier to typically access illicit substances than illicit, even though they are controlled under federal law. So McCabe and colleagues, not too long ago, it was actually this year, examined the association between school level stimulant therapy for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and non and prescription stimulant uh, non-medical use, so abuse or misuse. And they looked at data of about 230,000 students across 3,000 high schools in the US. And uh, the abuse ranged from zero to 25% and dependent on the number of students being prescribed stimulants to treat ADHD, which speaks to the fact that the vast majority of students get prescription medications for their non-medical use and therefore abuse or misuse from their peers. And that applies not only to high school age youth, but also young adults in and, and graduate school, whether that be graduate medical education or traditional PhD programs. I remember doing my postdoctoral fellowship training at the University of Minnesota Medical School and hearing about residents taking uh, stimulants that were not prescribed to them to study for the step exams. Demir, when I was in medical school, one of my med school classmates actually, um, depending on the test, it wasn't all the time with uh, with a lot of frequency, but would pop handfuls of Sudafed um, and yeah. said that that was a big thing um, when he played college hockey and called it the red, um, oh, the red rockets, which is I know called mm -hmm. other things is called that too. But that's what that was very common in my med school class. And, and think about, you know, we think about equity and, and, and accessibility and, and equality you know, what does it speak to that there are certain substances that are more common across the sociodemographic spectrum, right? And, and what is associated with that? Not too long ago this year, Ku Pham at the University of Minnesota and several other colleagues and I looked at sociodemographic factors among uh, residents across the university five years. And we looked at the you know, underrepresented in medicine factors and sociodemographic characteristics and found that the strongest predictor of attending and matriculating for medical school are, you know, SES, meaning access to, to resources, study materials, uh, friends and family who are physicians or in the medical field and, and income. And that those students who are underrepresented in medicine had four times more adverse childhood experiences or were four times more likely to have those compared to their traditional white counterparts, which then feeds into some of the accessibility issues and substance misuse, feeling like that, well, because it's a prescribed medication, regardless of whether or not it is being prescribed to you, that it is not viewed as, as negative, right? 
They also found these factors to increase uh, substance misuse. Obviously, parents with higher levels of education, schools in the northeastern region of the U.S., schools located in suburban areas, higher proportion of white students, and schools with medium levels of binge drinking. So would you say that this is surprising or not? Or does it just really confirm some of the preconceived maybe notions or ideas that you've had or heard? You know, to me, Demir, one of the interesting things is it, it feels to me like when I see patients from demographics that are lower income, they never got the evaluations they should have. And, and many of them should have been on stimulants and never were, uh, where when I see the upper middle class, so many of them are on them, mostly because of access to care. So I, I, I mean, I see this all the time. It's just crazy to me. Absolutely. And you bring up a really good point, Kurt, in terms of uh, evaluations and assessments. I, I've sent several people to, you know, counselors, psychologists, therapists to get evaluated for ADHD. And, you know, they come back to me and, and they say, well, I, I didn't screen as positive, even though all signs and symptoms pointed to that. But then once I look at what tests and instruments were administered, they were given as an adult, the child and adolescent version of an instrument. So you have validity and reliability issues, meaning that someone could not meet the diagnostic criteria for no other reason than the incorrect instrument being used. And if you're unaware of what that means, right, that, that really cuts across other factors of your life and you may be self-medicating without being aware. You know, it makes me think of uh, just energy drinks, which have spiked in, in popularity. And one in particular has been developed by a you know, social media personality that's called Prime. I don't know if you've seen them at gas stations. They're really bright neon colors. They have between two and 300 milligrams of caffeine. How much caffeine is in an average cup of coffee? It varies between 20 and 60. So you're consuming, you know, five to 10 times the amount of uh, daily recommended caffeine intake. Next one. Adolescents who start stimulant therapy for ADHD uh, late, so after 10 years of age, and are prescribed a shorter period of time, so under 12 months, are more likely to misuse prescription stimulants or cocaine. So those who start therapy later and are on it shorter are more likely to misuse. True, false, true, false. A lot of truths there. And think about, you know, over the past 10 years, what you've heard in, in the mainstream practice, at least I have, is that if you are prescribed stimulants at an earlier age, you're more likely to develop dependence and abuse. That's true. Um, so McCabe and colleagues looked at uh, the age of onset and duration of stimulant therapy and whether they were associated with cocaine, methamphetamine, and prescription stimulant misuse during adolescence. And they looked at uh, multiple socioeconomic demographic factors across 150,000 high schools in the United States. So it's the Monitoring the Futures survey. And they found an inverse relationship between years of stimulant therapy or illicit or uh, prescription stimulant misuse, which looks something like this. The shorter the duration, the more likely you are to abuse. The longer, the less likely. Now, why is that? Or the later? You choose to self-medicate because it worked. Right. And, and at what point do you reach the threshold of independence? You know, think about, well, I'm just doing this because it helps me, which may very much be the case, right? And on the other hand, dependence is a, is a factor of biochemical processes and psychological um, considerations where you, as much as you want to stop, you can. Young adults who misuse their own prescription stimulants are less likely to report polysubstance use. True or false? Let 
Let me ask, how many of you think that young adults who misuse stimulants also misuse other substances? Probably a lot. And I would say they're more likely to not report. So I would say true on this one because they don't think that there's a problem with it. Like there's right. lack of insight. And and I would say, again, going back to my initial thoughts, that while it's prescribed to me, I'm not, you know, misusing it. But if you take more than you should, you're not taking, uh, you know, you're not following uh, recommendations or treatment guidelines. But it's actually false. So Holti and colleagues examined prescription stimulant misuse among 530 undergraduate uh, college students, and they classified sources into five different groups. So where people got the, the medication, peer or dealer given by a friend, own prescription, lower multiple sources, or any source. And the second group served as a reference point for the statistical analyses. And then students who misused their own prescription were less likely to report polysubstance use, like marijuana and alcohol. But at the same, students were more likely to screen positive for mental health problems. So then you will have students and, and patients, potentially, who come into your practice and they say, nope, I don't smoke marijuana, I don't drink, you know, occasionally I'll, I'll take uh, Adderall uh, above and beyond what's recommended. But no, I don't abuse, you know, anything. And at the same time, they'll exhibit symptoms of anxiety, anger, suicidality, irritability. And so how can you really trace the underpinnings and, and the causes? Is it, is it the substance use or is it the mental health symptoms and um, impairment? Then how do you go about treating if they're unaware and um, not cognizant of, of the relationship and really uncomfortable disclosing what the case is? So when we look at stimulants uh, misuse and abuse, we have to look at the really cyclical process and the broad impact on functioning. Not only are there individual health consequences, uh, psychological um, uh, as well, but also academic and occupational impact, increased risky behaviors, long-term dependence, social and interpersonal impact, and then a broader public health concern. You know, in the previous slide, I mentioned how the vast majority of uh, individuals who misuse prescribed stimulants don't acknowledge or uh, view abusing marijuana as, as a problem. That's going to only worsen now with marijuana being legalized. So misuse of stimulants like amphetamine or, or Adderall can lead to cardiovascular problems, neurological disorders, psychiatric disturbances, and a risk of developing broader substance use disorders. How many of you in, in your practice have encountered patients, clients, who have come with a primary substance use disorder that may be like alcohol or you know, methamphetamine, but then after a little more inquiry, it turns out that they're also using and have been prescribed legitimately Adderall or another stimulant. And then how do you tease apart the efficacy or the need for that, right? So someone comes into treatment at the residential level of care and they genuinely have ADHD. They, they can't focus, they struggle paying attention, they're constantly fidgeting, but they're also dependent on methamphetamines and, and potentially other substances. And if you don't prescribe the stimulants that they need, they may not be able to pay attention, which creates an acyclical process of withdrawal and protracted recovery. The academic and occupational impact, you know, the misuse of these drugs is often driven by the belief that enhanced focus and cognitive abilities can lead to a false sense of, of achievement. So, you know, over time, that really impairs your concentration, your memory, and your overall cognitive functioning. Part of that, too, is that it impairs your socio-emotional um, I mean, ability for lack of a better words. So think of Adderall at higher dosages. There's evidence to suggest that not only is it, you know, an appetite suppressant, but that it leads to emotional blunting because there's such a hyper-focus on, on the task at hand. And then increased 
behaviors that are risky. So youth who misuse stimulants are more prone to experimenting with other substances, engaging in unsafe sex, driving under the influence, and, and other things. So going back to the cyclical process, right? You, they are abusing their prescribed medication. Their emotional um, affect is blunted or decreased. They're hyper-focused. And as a result of all of that, they're more likely to experiment and use other substances, but not acknowledge any of it. Well, long-term dependence. So the continued misuse can lead to tolerance, dependence, and addiction. And so the treatment interventions must be much more comprehensive and potentially impact an individual's long-term health. We know that prescribed stimulants, even when used accordingly and as uh, recommended, can lead to long-term cardiovascular problems because your um, you know, blood pressure, all the things that you know better than I, can rebalance at a higher level or your baseline is higher than it would be otherwise. And, and the reality is we don't know the long-term effects on, on physical health. What about the social and interpersonal impact? Focus shifts primarily towards obtaining and using the stimulants. So you're uh, avoiding and neglecting personal responsibilities and not engaging in social activities. So take that in addition to just hyper focus, right? So you're hyper focused on the task at hand. You may be, you know, high, have a buzz from the substance, but then conversely, you're spending most of your time trying to get more of the medication, whether it be from friends, peers, or, or, or your drug dealer. And that impacts or starts to deteriorate your overall social functioning. And, you know, some of this may be basic and, and silly, but at the same time, it illustrates just the complexities of how medications that are prescribed to treat genuine uh, disorders become quickly misused and fall under the radar of healthcare professions. And so the public health concern is is broadly the impact on the system, law enforcement agencies, and educational institutions. By addressing the issue, we can reduce the societal costs um, and promote healthier communities. And there's also a lot of disparity, as I mentioned earlier. To give you an example, I used to do a lot of forensic evaluations for asylum uh, claims in the United States. And one of the burdens of proof, and I'm not explaining it correctly since I'm not an attorney, um, are of moral character. So are you a good person? Super broad, all kinds of things wrong with it, but it's still one of the factors. And there's a case often cited in which a foreign born medical student was using Adderall to study um, very much like his peers, but because he wasn't a US citizen yet and he had a pill in his shoe, he was hiding it. He was convicted of possession of a controlled substance, which is a felony, and therefore makes you inadmissible, right? So what you, for you and I might lead to a slap on the wrist, don't do it, has serious and significant implications to, to other people. So I am not confident I'm gonna get through all of this, but we'll do the best that, that we can or that I can. But three objectives, increase awareness and knowledge, enhance screening and assessment, and develop strategies for intervention and, and prevention. We'll talk about increasing awareness and knowledge, which we have been. You should be able to click on all these hyperlinks if you can't after the fact. Um, through the handout, I can send the actual slides through Kurt. Um, and, and others so they can share. But SAMHSA developed uh, this really nice substance use wheel that uh, is, uh, codes different uh, uh, chemical compounds and the categories, and this is for amphetamine type stimulants. And they are a broad category that really encompass a large grouping of legal or illegal or illicit or illicit substances. It includes amphetamines, methylphenidate, amphetamine derivatives, and then cathinones, so bath salts. Look at this graph and let me know what stands out. So these are trends in lifetime use of stimulants from 2012 to 2022 for 8th, 10th, and 12th graders. And yes, this is supposed to be an aesthetic, but it also points something out.
So genes and COVID. Mm -hmm. So this would be statistically significant enough of a deviation to say it's it's not due to um, or that it's due to contextual factors. So we see a drop for eighth graders. You look at, you know, I can move this here. So you can see the most recent 2019 being at 6.6%, and then the following year dropping down to that's not right, to 4.3% down here. But why did it drop so drastically for eighth graders and not necessarily as much for 10th? and 12th graders. How old are youth at each of these ages? Well, the ability to drive. Mm -hmm. Staying home from the pandemic, right? Stimulant shortage, remember that? There was a shortage in manufacturing of, of medications. But the other thing that's concerning, or should be, and this is that large study of 350,000 youth, is these are eighth graders, you know, up until different points, anywhere from eight to 10% of eighth graders, so one in 10, was misusing stimulants. So that would be what an eighth grader is 10, 11, right? So you have a 10, 11 year old, maybe older, I'm not good at math. That's or I can do statistics, 14. So close enough, right? Um, I can do statistical analyses all day, but I can't count up to 15. Um, you have 14 year olds abusing stimulants and completely flying under the radar. And so Richard Meech at the University of Michigan was one of the permanent authors of the study wrote that it's conceivable that there was an increase in the need for treatment during the pandemic due to adolescents being under more stress. Another possibility is that sheltering at home during the pandemic may have made any attention issues of adolescents more salient to their parents. So two things that speak to me in that. One, we're not teaching effective coping skills in response to contextual stressors and, and their impact. Granted, the pandemic is an extreme example of that, but you know it could be anything else. The other thing is, it's not a problem until the parents think it's it's a problem. Uh, Demir, did they break that down further into areas of the country or different socioeconomical or um, yeah, that's the uh, original. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that original study that I mentioned earlier. So Northeastern United States, where there's a higher concentration of universities and schools, and there's more emphasis placed on academic achievement, it is more prevalent in uh, suburban areas, no, upper I, to middle. I was thinking like, more just this increase, like with those ages, like this most recent oh, jump. Yeah, no, they haven't. That okay. they haven't. No, it hasn't been stratified across, uh, across those demographic characteristics. And which, which, I'm going to expect they will be doing because there's a large enough data set to not lose any statistical power the vast majority of the time when when researchers don't go so granular into into the data it's because they lose any and all predictive ability the more variables you add on to it sure but i would expect that absolutely it's stratified across socio-demographic factors hmm. so here's some of the articles that i pulled from Google News dating back to 2020. Are the kids all right supporting your teen's mental health through COVID-19? Nobody talks about it because everyone is on it. Adderall presents esports with an enigma. And what's that last one say? Have prescriptions for stimulants to treat ADHD increase, so did pharma payment to doctors. What about the next year? Suicide attempts among adolescent girls surged by more than 50% during the pandemic. Substance use among teens dropped significantly in 2021. And Instagram makes it easy for teens to find drugs. The year after, high school athletes in contact sports more likely to misuse prescription stimulants throughout their 20s. And conversations between teenagers can predict future drug alcohol abuse. 
Hmm. So this is a three year period, right? And we see that how much it, it dropped here off during the pandemic. That wasn't anywhere in the news. So the dissonance between mainstream media portrayals and not to you know, speak negatively of, of the media, but also when, when issues don't get highlighted long-term, they tend to fall out of everyone's mind. And so Dr. Robert Califf of the Food and Drug Administration wrote in May that if only the people that needed these drugs got them, there probably would not be a shortage. There is a large amount of use which is on the margins, and this is why we need better clinical standards. Right? What's appropriate and what's an appropriate use? Um, you know, I'll self-disclose I have ADHD, and you, know, you probably could have figured that out in the first 10 minutes uh, of this presentation. But depending on the severity in the beginning when I was uh, unmedicated and undiagnosed, you know, I would literally spend four hours staring at the computer trying to write one paragraph. It would be paralyzing. And so it can have significant impacts and, and treating it for such limited uh, or such significant functional impairment is significantly different than it would be as I think you mentioned, right? The average person walking into a primary care clinic and kind of talking about a few different symptoms and getting a 10 milligram prescription of Adderall. So any variable or condition that increases the likelihood of someone developing or experiencing a core occurring disorder is a risk factor. And so we talk about uh, personal things, so societal factors, environmental, biological markers that all contribute to the overall vulnerability. And so here we look at risk factors, definitions, and whether or not they're preeminent or more impactful in adolescence or young adulthood. So early use, engaging uh, in use at a young age, early problem behaviors, rebelliousness, favorable attitude, peer substance use, and genetic predictors are all individual and peer risk factors. Look at family risk factors, problem management or lack thereof, conflict, a favorable attitude towards substance use, and a family history. A favorable attitude doesn't have to be um, you know, mom and dad use heroin, so it's not, it's not a big deal. A favorable attitude is just as much of saying, oh, it's Adderall, it's not that big of a deal. And the reason that those perceptions are different really falls across socioeconomic spectrum, right? If somebody is an upper uh, middle class uh, of that, they're more likely to normalize misuse of a performance enhancing substance. And I mean, just calling it that is drastically different than saying you're popping pills or abusing Adderall. It's a performance enhancer. In school, academic failure, lack of commitment. But as you can see, what makes this really difficult is that these are also some predictive factors of being undiagnosed. These are the only factors and they're in the community that are different between young adulthood and uh, adolescence. So media portrayals, more impactful adolescents, low neighborhood attachment, disorganized community, and low SES. Go back to that graph that I showed you of eighth grader is really dipping. Low neighborhood attachment. If you are socially isolated, you know, but more engaged and paying attention to your neighborhood, you're less likely to use. Speaking uh, similarly to high population density, lack of natural surveillance, public spaces, and high crime. So Journey and colleagues looked at 12 studies across almost 220 participants for the relationship between alcohol marketing and substance uh, subsequent use. And they found that the mediator so a mediator is uh, any factor that increases the strength of a relationship. A mediator influences the direction of that relationship. So the strength of the relationship between exposure to alcohol and use is marketing receptivity, brand recognition, and experiences. So if 
youth were receptive to marketing, recognized the brand and had an experience with it, that relationship between um, exposure and use increased or strengthened. Does that make sense? That's very manipulative in some ways. You know, buyers and colleagues looked at the 17,000 adolescents in the US and Australia at both risk and protective factors for substance use. And, you know, across sociodemographic characters, both samples shared social detachment as a strong risk factor for use. What's social detachment? Feeling disconnected, feeling like you don't belong. Alcohol or drug use dependence and access to treatment were all positively associated with neighborhood disorganization. So this was a large study at the Los Angeles Public School Survey. And interestingly, they looked at the association between substance use, both early and long-term, across about 3,400 students. And while low parental economic status was associated with substance use, lack of engagement is a stronger predictor. So lack of engagement and social disconnect is a stronger predictor of early onset and long-term substance use than socioeconomic status would challenge us some of those preconceived notions of, well, if you're in a low socioeconomic spectrum, um, you know, it's kind of like a sentence and you're not going to get away from that. You know, we talk about the physical health effects, but the route of administration actually determines dosage, rapidity, intensity of effects. You know, Adderall can be taken orally, right? How, what are other ways it can be well, it's in there, it can be ingested. What about your gums? So taking dust and then rubbing it on your gums, right? Is that quicker in terms of absorption than orally? Yeah, there's no metabolism breakdown right. and you know most adolescents as far as i know don't think about it that way but they'll try it and whoa that worked quicker right and then interestingly stimulants can actually cause the same symptoms that they're used to be treating um, so obviously anxiety, paranoia, restlessness, agitation, and panic attacks. Several years ago, there were a lot of media, uh, was a lot of media covered, particularly in the Southern United States and Florida, where police officers and, and other agents were supposedly uh, exposed to fentanyl um, through touch, but they weren't dermal patches. They, they weren't, you know, in the air and they experience an overdose. Well, the American Academy of Toxicology and the American Academy of Pharmacy both released a statement saying that the vast majority of those times, it was a fear-induced anxiety attack rather than absorption through your skin. You know, unless it's a patch or it's in the air, you handling it isn't likely going to get uh, get anywhere. But that speaks to just a significant impact of what you perceive. few more interesting studies in terms of consequences. So, you know, the benefits of stimulants are oversold and a performance enhancer. But if you look at research, there's actually little to no information on associated risk factors. Hmm. Similarly, Boyd uh, and colleagues in 2006, so it's an older study now, surveyed 1,000 middle and high school students in Michigan on prescription medication misuse of sleeping pills, sedative stimulants, opioids. And each motive for use increased the uh, subsequent abuse by 1.8 times. So every time they had a reason while well, I'm doing it to study, that increased your risk of abuse 1.8 times. Well, I'm just going to use it to get past this exam 1.8 times. It's a compounding effect. Interpersonal functioning. So, 
a submissive communal interpersonal style and a high warmth authoritative parenting style was associated with higher levels of unsociability, anxiety, and internalizing symptoms. Meaning that adolescents with highly responsive authoritative parents are largely protective from substance related consequences through delayed onset of use. So what does that mean in plain English? Parents who are authoritative and submissive communal, so they give in, but it's a collaborative effort, have children who, if they abuse substances, are more likely to do so at a later age. Why? Could it be involvement? Presence? So the levels of either communion or agency and low levels of parental responsiveness or demandingness placed adolescents at high risk. It, it, it just means that neither extreme is really good. So enhanced screening and assessment. And we might actually just might make this through. That's a good question. So, uh, Samantha, do you know if people who take stimulants for hypersomnia may also abuse or be at higher risk? Yeah. And, and, and the reason for that being, you know, regardless of whether you're being prescribed the substance off label, the underlying chemical reactions and pathways that are created as a result do predispose you to dependence. Mm -hmm. So NIDA launched two validated and brief online screening tools for substance use among adolescents. How many of you are aware of this? Yeah, so uh, Christine, why would they be addicted later? Well, the, the reasoning is that it's a protective factor and that it delays onset until there is less parental oversight for those who are going to use or abuse regardless. But it also deters another subset of the population from using to begin with because they're high, there's a higher connectedness and perceived caring. The important consideration is perceived caring, you know, rather than actual so much of what happens to us as human beings and in our personal functioning and uh, intrapersonal abilities is due to perception. So the, the saying of what you believe is true does apply. So the two tools that are used for, they're available for free, you can download them in links are the, I'm gonna go through them, the BSTAD and the S2BI. But real quick, we'll talk about validity and reliability in the context of testing, as I mentioned earlier. So validity is accuracy and appropriateness. So does the instrument measure what it's intended to measure? If you're screening for anxiety, are you actually measuring anxiety? Reliability is consistency. So to what degree does the instrument provide consistent findings? If I am um, you know, screening positive today, am I going to be positive tomorrow? So the instrument could therefore be reliable, give you consistent findings, but not valid. So it'll, for example, tell you that you don't have your anxiety, you're fine, but really you're, you're interested in depression. So the brief screener for tobacco, alcohol, and other drugs includes frequency of use questions for adolescents between 12 and 17 years. And it primarily asks about tobacco, alcohol, and marijuana, but research has shown that given the poly substance relationship between all of those, it is more likely than not that there's also stimulant misuse or abuse. And that is classified across responses and risk categories. So a zero day response reports no use, one day is the lower risk, and then two or more days of alcohol and drug use, or six or more days of tobacco use collectively places individuals into the high risk category. The screening to brief intervention tool, very similar frequency of use questions, but that adolescents who report use once or twice in the past year are unlikely to meet the criteria for a diagnosis in the mental health uh, uh, diagnostic and the manual. But those who report monthly use will likely meet the criteria. 
and adolescents who report weekly use will almost always meet a criteria. So this is more of a triage tool, right? To give you just a sense of whether or not it is more likely than not. And that's the ultimate goal, right? I just, you, know, you might have a gut feeling, but you're not sure. So Demir, now that you mentioned the whole gut feeling thing, have they ever looked at like that correlation or done any kind of studies on, you know, here we have the screening test, but then if you're in it with your provider, regardless of the type of provider, whether it's a physician or um, like a mm -hmm. therapist or something, and you're perceived as the provider risk, you know, like, are they exhibiting these behaviors? Are they saying these things? that would make you raise the red flags? Like, have they studied like what the, how, you know, how much more accurate are providers perceptions versus these screening tools? Yeah, so I'll actually talk about that a little bit okay. in the context of motivational interviewing. But something to remember as a provider, regardless of, of your background, is gut feeling is an oversimplification. But to, to, to give you an example, you, what's, if you're a physician, you go to, four years undergrad, right? Four years medical school, and if you're doing residency and, and fellowship between two and four years. So you can make a decision pretty quickly in a couple of minutes. Um, if we were to make the argument that, you know, time is money, well, a two minute decision shouldn't pay that much. But the reason you're able to make a decision so quickly is because of the years of training that you've had. Right? And so I'll talk about that in a bit. But the physical and mental health effects, you need to look at appetite, weight loss, sleep disturbances, cardiovascular issues, neurological complications, and evaluate the impact on the individual's functioning. And that is, I mean, more so, yes, a gut feeling, but also something observable. And then frequency and duration, determine the frequency and duration of the abuse, evaluate whether it's isolated, occasional, or persistent. Separating substance use from underlying mental health conditions, you know, of course, that's difficult. But chronic and frequent use has more often than not, and I know that's a poor answer, underlying causes induced by mental health functioning or dysfunctioning. And then how is it impacting, you know, relationships, extracurricular activities, social functioning? You know, if you look at a 15-year-old, we all have a general idea of what a 15-year-old would be like or should be like. Right? How much are they deviating from that? And then risky behaviors and consequences, legal, educational, or social. And of course, you know, treatment history, interventions, and withdrawal or dependency. But the reason, and, and there are a few studies that have looked at uh, provider uh, perception and actual diagnostic matching, you know, following the fact. And there was a high correlation, I think the 80th percentile of accuracy and coming close within the actual diagnostic criteria without additional information, just based on the initial um, overview or the glance, which is why both of those screening tools by the NIDA are using a broad spectrum of identification. You know, yes or no questions along a short period of time for three substances that have been shown to be associated with poly substance use. These are some uh, strategies. Um, you know, you probably all have heard of uh, motivational interviewing, um, but I want to talk a little bit differently about it. So again, MI is the directive and person centered interview style in that let's say behavioral change. Um, you know, you're evaluating and. and Resolving ambivalence, you know, elicit, provide, elicit. However, in the past few years, MI has become the new, you know, I hate calling it this, but the new sexy thing to do, right? Just like trauma was not too long ago. But the developers of MI have uh, said that, well, specifically, using MI in the proper spirit requires almost constant internal monitoring by the therapist. Certain emotions, such as an urge to persuade, confront, or warn the client, are assigned to stop and choose another direction for a therapeutic effort. As soon as you start thinking about using MI to get to something, you're already doing it wrong. Does that make sense? And is that somewhat because, provider um, personality dependent or stigma dependent? You know, they always say, check your own biases at the door. 
But there's a lot of things, you know, depending on what personally we as providers have been through in our histories. Sure. I think that can definitely impact either are you doing it right or wrong or your success in it. And the same with Absolutely. your ability to the gut feeling. Absolutely. And I think part of it is just, you know, the spirit of MI is just being genuinely curious. That's all it is. And helping whoever resolve ambivalence by asking those questions. Um, question here, is it ethical to diagnose adolescent early early adolescence, SUD, treatment, or risk to exposure? So, you know, according to all diagnostic criteria, you're un, unable and, un, and it's therefore unethical to diagnose an underlying mental health condition typically for three weeks or beyond following medically monitored detox because symptoms of any one substance can mimic mental health symptoms. That being said, if there's collateral information with the previous treatment history, diagnostic assessments that can speak to underlying mental health conditions and you can set it as a rule out. But the rule of thumb is typically you're unable to diagnose. You have to choose the most appropriate diagnosis at that time. So it may be you know, substance-induced anxiety disorder, which is accurate. You wouldn't maybe be able to say anxiety disorder, even though that may be ultimately what it is. So these are three things that, uh, for MI, we'll talk about that in a, in a bit, but these are really the three things you need to know. You don't have to go to any fancy training, even though, you know, it's, a, it's useful to learn more in the spirit, but gain insight into the patient's knowledge and their information, engage in questioning, deliver information in an unbiased manner, aiming for neutrality. And of course that's hard, but part of it is acknowledging and accepting and saying, look, I understand that I'm your doctor. And so probably some of the things that I'm doing are biased because I have your best interests in mind. And then assess their comprehension of the information shared. You know, how do you understand that? People may be embarrassed and say they don't understand things. They don't want to seem stupid. You know, Demir, that is the spirit. Yeah, go ahead. You know, there's one of the hardest things, I think, especially with, you know, attention issues is by the time the patient comes to you, they have studied it. Right. So they know what they're going to kind of they've already bought into that. They have it. So you're you're interviewing. They're going to they're going to feed you back what they've read off. And don't you think? Oh, absolutely. And that's why a comprehensive battery of assessments. Actually, when I uh, uh, diagnosed adolescents, I'll interview the parents, I'll interview teachers, I'll observe them at school without them knowing, I'll observe them at school with them knowing, I'll observe them outside of school, I'll speak to their doctors. I mean, this takes a long, long time to get a comprehensive understanding. And then you're puzzling together almost in a forensic fashion, different parts of collateral information. You're not relying on just one source of information. Now with older adults, I, I think that depending on the instruments that you're using, that they also have a scale for malingering or lying, that the diagnosis you get from that instrument is going to be accurate. But for you, that's not the case because there aren't as many instruments, so you heavily rely on, on collateral documentation. And more often than not, it's best to refer to a specialist, whether that be a psychologist or a neurologist, who, who can do that advanced testing and then come to uh, making a recommendation for prescription. So typically it's the providers that then the prescribing providers, unless they are a psychiatrist, um, they will work with a the therapist. The other factor being, you know, uh, reimbursement, you know, as a psychiatrist, um, you know, if you're working on an RVU based model, right? Psychological testing is gonna take a lot more in time than what you're reimbursed. But the evaluation and management session would be, you know, reimbursed adequately. Therefore, you can split the difference by referring to an external provider who can bill at the appropriate code and 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 do the due diligence and then work with you to prescribe. Here, and then harm reduction. I, you know, harm reduction can mean a lot of different things to different people, but ultimately, at the end of the day. You know, the United Nations has written that while medical models of treatment for individuals with alcohol and opioid use disorder are well accepted and implemented worldwide, you know, in most countries, there's no parallel for stimulant use disorder. So harm reduction has to, has to be ultimately part of the arsenal if complete abstinence doesn't work. And yet, because we don't know the long-term effects, physical and psychological, it's quite dangerous. 
Here's the other thing too, being on opioid overdose, youth who use stimulants are um, more likely to unintentionally overdose on opioids and they should be counseled accordingly. And one of the public policy recommendations for harm reduction is to offer uh, fentanyl test strips and decrease the risk and uh, naloxone. Um, you know, medication options for stimulant use disorder are very limited, but even within those are largely ineffective. And the most effective intervention supports contingency management. So positive reinforcement to encourage desired behaviors. So if abusing uh, prescription stimulants uh, as a performance enhancer, uh, is the motivation, you know, one of those factors is positive reinforcement and wanting to achieve and wanting to do well. So it's modeling that positive reinforcement from a po different perspective. And then utilizing positive uh, enforcement with tangible goods for younger children, clearly defining treatment goals, and then monitoring and verification, right? Trust, but verify. You know, immediate rewards, and that's the thing, especially if there's some legitimate, you know, undiagnosed uh, neurocognitive disorder like ADHD, there's going to be impulsiveness and a need for immediate reward. But even people who are coming off of the prescription stimulants are going to exhibit some symptoms very much uh, aligned with the actual disorder, even if they don't have it. At the end of the day, and again, this sounds silly, but uh, being non-judgmental, building trust, and creating an open environment, uh, being uh, accommodating for follow-up appointments, you know, that all is important to long-term uh, recovery and, and, and sustained recovery. And then understanding motivation. Motivation is perhaps among the single most or strongest predictors of stimulant misuse and abuse. As we talked about or I mentioned, that every factor or reason for using increases the likelihood for abuse and dependence 1.8 times. Hmm. So I'll stop sharing my screen with that. You know, one of the questions that I think is asked frequently is, uh, when do you stop stimulants? At what age or at what in what situation? You know, when we look at opioids, for instance, like does the patient have um, functional improvement, right, with these medications. And is, I mean, I see people all the time, and I'm seeing somebody on Tuesday who's in her late 60s, still on Adderall, right? Is like, is is there a point where they don't need stimulants, and we should be trying to, you know, stop that if they're not working, they're not in school, they're, you know, they can function. Right. What's your thoughts on that? Well, I think part of it is how we define functioning. Yep. Right. Do you do I need to take my Adderall? Probably not. Right. I, I think the one of the best examples I can give for a lack of dependence for me is that there have been multiple times where I'm just way too lazy to get the prescription filled or I just forget about it and then I'll go a month without it. Right. And I take an inadvertent month long holiday to reset myself. But that's also very different than people who are unwilling or unable and they don't know why they're taking it. You know, taking it for your job and having specific cues is drastically different than saying, well, I've just taken it for the past 15 years. Well, and then whether and, I, I, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I would just say like whether or not they, you know, maybe do you outgrow it or whatever, but psychologically, there is that psychological component. And if you think, well, I can't do my job if I don't have it, whether you could or not. And I, to me, that's that harm reduction model. Yeah, It's, it, you know, especially if we're not doing refills early, there's no other concerns. And, and I mean, if they're taking three this day and none this day, does that count as inappropriate use and a reason to taper or not? I mean, I think there's a lot of gray in there, but ultimately, I guess the way that I look at it is that harm reduction model. Absolutely. And another good point, as you know, Nada said here that, you know, and then the other consequences of stopping, right? So typically stimulants are appetite suppressants, and then you'll have people who don't want to get off them because they're going to gain a tremendous amount of weight. But then, you know, I've also heard for better or for worse, stimulants being used off label for weight loss. But I mean, you know, they were buying into societal expectations and normalizing 
something with significant health, uh, negative health outcomes that we don't fully understand. Mm. So at the beginning, you gave data with the ADHD meds and starting later, like the 10, and then more likely to misuse if they were initiated later. You know, I was always under, in relation to like cocaine and other substances, you know, kind of what I learned early on was that if you actually treat a person who needs the meds, it actually decreases their chance of like meth use disorder later in life. Does that still hold? Or is it still like risky either way? Uh, two different answers. And you're right. I actually thought about that after I looked at the research. And part of it is that research tends to flip-flop depending on, you know, the, the pendulum. By the time that you read a study, it's anywhere from six months to three years old already. So the study that we just published uh, in the Journal of Graduate Medical Education on the underrepresented in medicine, we started that five years ago. And it just got published you know, with the data collection and whatnot. So on one hand, yes, it does, that that holds because you're prescribing. But the reason it holds, the argument goes, is that while well, you're delivering the substance in a different way, so therefore they're not resorting to other substances or, or, or methods. And at the same time, you know, if somebody doesn't have, you know, the, 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 the disorder, right? they're less likely to be abusing it. There is a subset of that population. But part of it isn't just prescribe and forget. It's ongoing evaluation and, and engagement and you know, being able to say, hey, I want you to take a UDS randomly to see whether or not it's in your system. And you know, a lot of times I'll do that to see that they're not being sold or whatnot. But looking at the monitoring uh, data, how often are people failing it? What are the patterns? Is it, is it consistent? Is it erratic? Um, So it's yes to both, but I'm also not sure what's going to change in the next five years. The reality is that there isn't an impetus to study prescription stimulant misuse because the the truth is it's also a very profitable market. So to piggyback on that, sorry, Kurt, is patients who have a history of stimulant use disorder, meth use disorder, your thoughts on then treating them with the stimulants when they're in recovery Um, Because this is kind of one of those debatable things, even in our world. Mm -hmm. Personally, I'll do it if they're out, you know, working in in whatever. I might monitor, give week long prescriptions, at least initially. But what are your thoughts on that? That was my question. Curry, I'm curious what you think, too. Yeah. And let me just say one thing before you kind of answer her question. It's like I saw a study years ago that showed that people who had you know, a, a stimulant use disorder who were appropriately placed on stimulants because they had issues actually were more likely to have a job, a car and a house um, and because they they needed it. And so I'm on Heather's team on that one. I I have quite a few and we just monitor them very closely. But your thoughts? I agree. And and so I've seen it go different ways. When I was at the Hazel and Betty Ford Foundation, we we had a policy and, and that's changed and evolved to uh, provider discretion. Meaning that if somebody genuinely has an, um, that underlying neurocognitive disorder without being medicated, they're going to suffer. I mean, yep. there's no better way to put it. They're going to suffer and it's not going to feel good, you know, and forget uh, the implications of trying to pay attention and learn coping skills when you're running 150 miles in your, in your head. Right. And, and that's a risk that you have to take and, and trust that gut feeling and the perception and the monitoring. So it can be done and it can be done really, really well. Now, who's to say that there isn't a group of people that's going to take advantage of it? And at the same time, in the three years of working residential, each time when I encountered someone asking for stimulants, it was pretty clear when they were abusing it and not wanting it to medicate some underlying mental health disorder. You know, there are, there isn't documentation. A physician isn't closely involved, right? And there isn't an ongoing conversation. And a handful of times what I've seen over the years, people not prescribed when they should have, then they relapsed. Mm-hmm. And I bet in an inpatient situation where you're observed, yeah, there's not necessarily that doctor they're monitoring, but you all have a lot of access to monitoring, at least observing um, at least these patterns. Do you guys give a lot of feedback back then to the prescribing provider if it's an outside person? 
Oh, absolutely. And we, we encouraged, uh, I mean, even where I'm at now, encourage collaboration and discussion and partnership, right? You may not know everything other than what the person is telling you. And look, with Google and chat GDP, I can go right now and type in what are the symptoms of ADHD. Yes, it's going to tell me I'm not a physician and you shouldn't be asking me these questions. But somebody can memorize it and rattle that off, right? It, it happens in primary care clinics, let alone in residential uh, treatment centers. But the truth is people can only maintain that for so long. And that's why that ongoing communication and collaboration is so important. Because I get it as a prescriber uh, of a controlled substance, you know, you may be hesitant of, you know, doing something that can have a negative adverse outcome and then having to answer to whatever federal agency for doing so, especially with laws coming down so hard now. Yeah. Heather, I suspect we're a bit over time. Yeah, I probably. I do have one kind of follow-up question, if, if that's okay. It's more with the, like, cannabis legalization and your thoughts on how that's going to impact then stimulant, whether it's prescribed and or illicit misuse. Yeah. I mean, so we had someone was, from Colorado on, but I would just like to kind of hear your thoughts having worked in inpatient settings with adolescents. Yeah, I think it's going to have a negative impact. The reason being that it's going to be even more socially stigmatized when we look at the existing research for other substances. Whenever something is normalized and socially accepted for good or for bad, it increases the propensity of abuse. So, you know, does that mean that, you know, I don't smoke marijuana? Does that mean that all of a sudden I'm going to go and start smoking? No, but that's not the, the issue. It's that it increases the peer pressure and the vulnerability factors of other uh, dimensions on that youth who can't think to, to begin with, right? If you can just walk in. But long term, it's not going to be a positive outcome because it's normalized. And in all the different states, when you know Nevada is a, a, a big case study for that, actually, where they talked about how we're going to use a tax revenue and pour them into the schools where marijuana, guess what didn't happen? Right? That money wasn't the tax revenue of marijuana wasn't funneled into the public education system. So therefore you weren't curbing any of the potential deleterious effects of substance misuse. But from everything that I've seen with cannabis being uh, um, a depressant in many ways and a stimulant being, an, uh, well, it's a stimulant, you're going to see youth much more likely resorting to external mechanisms and and substances to control what they should be doing internally now combine that with a social isolation of the pandemic and then decreases in overall intelligence there was a recent study that found that 12 graders now post pandemic have the similar, uh, similar intelligence quotient or iq as eighth graders pre-pandemic that's amazing that's bad. It's so sad. So over the next five years, we're going to see really the effects of this when the when the research catches up. Mm. Wow. So I'm well, glad my oldest is pre like only in seventh grade now. <laughs> I think that's the serious thing you've said. That, that's yeah. Because that's our future providers and, <laughs> and professionals society. Right. Absolutely. And we don't think about it. I mean, it's not a problem until it's it's a problem. And in many ways, that's great. I tell that to people who are anxious. It's not a problem until it's a problem. And at the same time, you're just pushing it away uh, to a different group of people to deal with. Right. Yeah. Well, wow, uh, Demir, that was uh, that was great talk. Uh, we really uh, appreciate you spending your time and your expertise with our group. It was a beautiful group today. I had over 100 people, which is that's I don't think that awesome. broke. So anything else? Thank you both. No, just thank you so much and your team for joining. And yeah, thank you everybody for logging in. This was fantastic. Um, we will get the, obviously this recording will be posted. 